knows is a guy named Bill Bradley. Um, Bill is uh, uh, was a uh, basketball player for Princeton. He was kind of like me. I got into Stanford University because of a 4.0, 1,600, 4.0 yards per carry, 1,600 receiving yards. Um, I, I was a football player. Not Nobody photoshopped my picture and put it on another football player. I, I'm sorry, I had to go there. News of the day. So Bill Bradley was like me. Uh, I believe in campaigning. My mom told me when I was first running for office, she said, Corey, uh, you are new to this community. I, had, I was from northern New Jersey, and I moved to Newark, New Jersey. Uh, my, the, the folks were telling me the only way you can win this election is by actually meeting the people and you've got to knock on tens of thousands of doors and uh, there's an old saying that I really believe, who you are speaks so loudly I can't hear what you say. You, when you meet somebody you tend to feel their spirit right away. And so Bill Bradley was doing that when he was coming up in New Jersey politics running for United States Senator and he, he goes to a very humble part of our state uh, with, with folks that were low income and a woman invited him into uh, uh, to her trailer and she was doing like my host did last night, offering tons of food, but he felt like, you know, I'm not going to eat this woman out of house at home, I'm a big guy, I'm going to wait. And so he just declined all the food and they sat down and they were talking, but there was a big bowl of nuts there. And, and Senator Bradley, uh, now Senator Bradley, then uh, candidate Bradley said he sub unconsciously just started eating the nuts because he was really hungry. And before he knew it, he ate this woman's entire bowl of nuts. And so after he finished his pitch, uh, he just said, look, I, I have to say, I'm so sorry, I just ate all your nuts. And she goes, honey, that is okay. I don't really like the nuts, so I just suck the chocolate off of them and leave them there. <laughs> Humorous who says, someone who's nice to you, but not nice to the waiter, is not a nice person. Uh, and I just want to say that th this morning, uh, Josh, who is the Salt Mill pub owner, got up very early to make sure we could do this. I don't know if Josh is in my sight, sight line at all. There he is. Josh, thank you very, very much. Um, your kindness is, is really, really appreciated. Let, let me jump right in because I'm excited to get to questions and answers, but I, I just want to uh, speak to, uh, from my heart. This is my second trip now up here uh, since I was uh, announced as a presidential candidate, and, and it means so much to me to get a chance to put before you all my heart, my passion, my ideas, uh, but a lot of my concerns as well. When I stand in a crowd like this, I am more encouraged than you know because I know I am here, we are here because crowds like this, groups like this, in local communities all across this country is what has defined the character of this country. We are a great nation, not because a bunch of folks in Washington really charted the course. I know that that's the history we read in our history books, but you all know it wasn't a bunch of fellas that huddled on the Senate floor back uh, in the early 1900s and said, hey guys, it's time that women have the right to vote, all right? Here we go, ready, break. No, it happened because of activists all around the country who would meet in groups like this and began pressing to make our country live up to who we say we are. It wasn't Strom Thurmond that one day came to the Senate floor and said, you know what, it's time those Negro people have some civil rights. No, it was activists, like folks in this room, blacks and whites, Christians and Jews, who bound together and understood that in this country, it's that shared sacrifice, it's that commitment to one another, that's where our strength is. I love the themes of rugged individualism and self-reliance in our country. My family has those themes as well, but if you look at the great achievements of America, we did them together. Rugged individualism didn't get us to the moon. It didn't map the human genome. It didn't beat the Nazis. It didn't beat Jim Crow. We did these things because of our commitment to community, our commitment to our country's ideals. And we're now at a point that a lot of folks are losing faith in our country's ability to get things done. There are people all over this nation who more and more are feeling left out. They're feeling left behind. They're feeling like they're struggling alone, but they're not alone. In my last trip here, I heard this incredible love and compassion when people would stand up and tell their truth. I met a woman in North Conway who spoke to me of common pain that people from New Jersey to New Mexico are feeling when she said, look, I make $28,000 a year and my prescription drug costs are $1,000 a month. There was a woman who spoke to me because what she was living was what my mom lived. She was a caregiver for a sick spouse 
My mom took care of my father who was struggling and eventually died from Parkinson's disease and taking care of a special needs child. We have a nation with this common pain where people are struggling and, and feel isolated, but they're not. We're in this together. And when you have a nation right now that is defining itself amongst other industrialized nations because our life expectancy is now going down because of opioid addiction, we have a crisis of suicide in this country from farmers to young men at rates we haven't seen since the Great Depression. We have a nation right now where people are feeling like the forces tearing us apart are stronger than the forces that are holding us together, and I don't believe that. I believe we still are a nation with common cause. We are still a nation with common purpose. We are still a nation that if we can create a stronger sense of community, if we can stand for each other and be there for each other, then we will rise together. Now, I know this not just because of my heart and my spirit, but it's my life story, which I know is a story that we all have experienced. I know the power of community, the power of Americans that demand that this nation live up to its promise and are willing to put themselves out there to do it because when my family in 1969 was trying to move to New Jersey, my parents met and married in Washington, D.C., and as they were moving to New Jersey, they looked for places with great public schools, which happened to be predominantly white communities. And when my parents started showing up at these neighborhoods to look at homes, the real estate agents would see them in Bergen County, New Jersey, and say, oh, I'm sorry, uh, this house is sold already, or this house has been pulled off the market. And so what did they find? A group of people like this room right here that met in New Jersey that said, we're going to make our country live up to its promise. We're going to be there for our neighbors. There were people of different faiths and different backgrounds, but they believed in an ideal. In America, we love our neighbors. No exception. We welcome strangers. And so next thing you know, they set up this ruse that with lawyers they got, they actually set up this sting operation where they would send my parents to look at homes and, and they would be told they were sold and then a white couple, volunteers, would come behind them and say, oh, I love this home, is it still for sale? And they'd find out the home was still for sale. On the house that I grew up in, 123 Norma Road in Harrington Park, New Jersey, my parents were told the house was sold, they leave, the white couple comes and finds out it's still for sale. They, they, they put a bid on the house, a proxy bid for my parents. The bid is accepted. Papers are drawn up. And on the day of the closing, the white couple did not show up. My father did, and a volunteer lawyer. And they walk into the real estate agent's office. And I always imagine this, this lawyer had practiced his speech all night. He walks in ready to go, you're in violation of fair housing law, federal law, but you're in violation of the morals of America. But he didn't get his speech out. Because as soon as he confronts a real estate agent, the real estate agent realizing he's caught, didn't just say, you got me, no. He stands up and punches my dad's lawyer in the face. And then he sigs a dog on my dad. And you have to understand that, that as I was growing up, every time my dad would tell this story, the dog would get bigger. <laughs> Eventually I was 18 years old and my dad's like, boy, I had to fight a pack of wolves to get you in this house. <laughs> That is the ideal my parents taught me. That is the America my family wanted to know. Yeah, my pa parents faced bigotry and hatred and discrimination, but every turn of their lives, they found community. They found the goodness, the decency of folks that understood if my family succeeds, their family is gonna be better for it. That if their children get great public schools, their kids will be better for it. These were the values that I found around my kitchen table in a community that embraced me and my brother. And so when I finished getting all this education that the senator told me about, my father would look at me and go, boy, you got more degrees in the month of July, but you ain't hot. <laughs> Life ain't about the degrees you get, it's about the service you give. Define your life by what you are willing to do because you are enjoying blessings that were paid for by the blood, sweat, and tears of your ancestors. You are here as an American. You breathe this air. You have the greatest privilege on the planet Earth because of things people did for you, and you can't pay them back, but you must pay it forward. So the first thing I did out of law school as a kid that is standing here today because of housing activists is I moved into the toughest neighborhood I could find in Newark, New Jersey, and began to work with tenant organizers to fight for housing rights. And people told me what we could not do. 
I'm tired all my career. I've heard people say we can't do that as if they ignore, as if they have historical amnesia. Because I know American history is a perpetual testimony to the achievement of the impossible. And so we took on slumlords that people said were too powerful and too connected to politicians in City Hall, and we beat them. And then I decided, you know what? Let's join together and beat City Hall. We ran an insurgent campaign beating one of the most powerful political machines in New Jersey, and I became mayor of the city of Newark. And people started telling me what I couldn't do. And I said, you're right, I can't do things, but we can. My, my, my residents in Newark didn't tell me when they elected me that we were going to fall into a global recession. I figured that that would have been good notice if they told me beforehand. But now we have to govern one of America's more struggling cities in the worst economy. And yeah, folk told me what we couldn't do. But we bounded together, created uncommon coalitions, and we created uncommon results. And let me tell you, we reached out to everybody, not just Democrats, but I reached out to conservatives and others trying to bring them together in common cause for an American city that had so much potential. And by the time I left to go to the United States Senate, Newark, New Jersey, only 6% of our state's population, but one out of every three building permits, construction permits in the entire state was going on to Newark. We brought thousands of jobs, new construction, supermarkets and food deserts. We transformed our school system. Now the highest performing school system in America for beat the odd schools, high poverty, high performance. Performance. People tell me what you can't do, but I know the power of Americans when we create community, when we see each other again with a more courageous empathy. Look, when I went to the United States Senate, I had campaigned all over my state about the issues New Jerseyans cared about, jobs and, and health care, but I also, everywhere I went, talked about a broken criminal justice system. And why? Because my pollsters told me, oh, that's not a top issue. Why are you talking about that so much? And I go, look, leaders aren't meant to follow consensus. They're meant to mold consensus. And, and so I talked about criminal justice reform. I got to the United States Senate. People told me you are not going to get anything passed on this issue. The Republicans will block you everywhere. And I'm like, no, I do not accept that. And then I got stunned because the bill I believed in Chuck Grassley, who would be the chairman of the Judiciary Committee, was on the floor lambasting my bill. And did I get up and lambast him? No, because I ran a fire department in New Jersey as a mayor, and I learned as a, as, as a mayor that it is really not a good strategy in putting out fires to fight fire with fire. You kinda, you kinda gotta bring some water. And so I could write a dissertation on my disagreements with Chuck Grassley, but I went to his office. And I sat down with them, and I started having conversations. I started asking him, how do you come to your conclusions? What are your core values? And then I started presenting to him my core values and a lot of the facts that our criminal justice system is so broken that the land of the free would have one out of every three incarcerated women on the planet Earth. That we have children that are in, in prison for months before trial and put in solitary confinement, which is considered torture by human rights activists because of the permanent damage it does to children. And before you knew it, we were agreeing on things. Before you knew it, we had a major bill done at a, the committee, and then eventually, just months ago, we passed it into law, including, <laughs> including a ban on the federal level of juvenile solitary confinement. <laughs> and so I believe in us. I'm running for president because I believe in who we are as a people. I believe in the power of the bonds that tie us together. I believe the lines that divide us are not as strong as the ties that bind us. I reject the politics of pitting Americans against each other, and I'm running for president because I want to call us to common cause, because we have common pain and we need to return to a sense of common purpose. I'm excited to talk to everybody about issues and ideas and engage with you, but I want you to know what drives me every single day on this campaign trail. My parents taught me that the call of this country was to create a more beloved community. That when Americans see each other and, and, and reignite a sense of civic grace, when we have a more courageous empathy for each other, we may define ourselves by different labels, religion, race, or even political party, but when we understand that there is common ground and common cause in this country, great things accomplished. And God, I want to rekindle that beloved community. I 
I don't care what title I have, that's my life purpose. Because when we have a beloved community in America, we will ensure that we have great public schools for every child because when your child doesn't get a great education or the teachers in your school are paid poverty wages, we all suffer as a result of that. I am going to fight for a beloved community in America. Because a beloved community says that if your child is drinking poisoned water with PFAs, then my child is going to suffer for the loss of their genius. A beloved community says, hey, when everyone in America has health care, then we all do better. A beloved community says, hey, when we are a nation that takes care of our veterans, when they, we find all this money to send them to war, and then when they come home, if we actually are there for them, that's what defines the greatness of a nation. Not their size and the strength of their military, but how the well they do for the people who are going to sacrifice and put their lives on the line for their country. We have to. Have a beloved community where health care is a right and child poverty is a wrong, where people struggling with opioid addiction don't have it treated with jail but with help, where we are a nation that says proudly and boldly that everyone who works a full-time job can have a living wage. These are the kind of things that show our investment in each other. And so let me finish with this. I believe the most common way people give up their power is not realizing they have it in the first place. And that somehow that, that some folks are beginning to doubt the power of Americans to transform this country. We, we now, it's almost popular, we have people that think the way you lift yourself up is by putting other people down. I am tired of the toxic trash talking, Twitter trolling that is, that is dominating our politics. As if you can't be strong. We were, Martha and I were talking about this morning. People mistake. They think that in order to be strong, you need to be mean. In order to be tough, you need to be cruel. I reject that. Strength is seen in kindness and decency and mercy. And so let me end with this ideal of power, and then let's have a conversation. What's real power? Power is in recognizing the connections between us. And knowing that, as King said, we are all caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a common garment of destiny. Well, that garment is being torn, but I still believe that we can be weavers again of community. And I know that because I've seen it in my own life. Let me tell you the, the second half of that story. You see, these lawyers and these folks, activists that got me into housing, I went to go write a book. It'll be surprising. In 2015, I wrote a book called United, Calling to This Country's Common Cause calling to a beloved community. But I had to go back and research the book because if you have a dad like mine, you gotta fact check the stories. <laughs> I mean, was it a pack of wolves or just a dog, for crying out loud? And so I go back to find the people who helped me move into the house. I was just a baby, it was the year I was born, 69. And I find the head of the Fair Housing Council from the 1960s, she was easy to find because she is still the head of the Fair Housing Council today. <laughs> She is 92 years old. Her name is Miss Lee Porter. Back then she was a young lady. Now she represents not black families trying to move into Bergen County, New Jersey. She represents Muslim families, same-sex couples, Americans with disabilities, because her, she believes we have one justice in America, that it has no color, it has no race, it is American justice. And so she still has her hands on the plow. And I call her and I talk to her and we have this incredible conversation and she says, well look, if you want to confirm the rest of the facts, talk to the lawyer who organized all the lawyers. I call him up. He's a retired judge in New Jersey, but back in the 1960s he had just started a business. He was struggling to make it. And when I call him up, I go, sir, I, my name is Corey. He goes, I know who you are. <laughs> and I'm like, all right, all right. Uh, well, do you know what you did for, I know what I did for your family. And I'm like, okay, sir, well, can you confirm all the facts? And he does. I have all the things I need for my book. He, in fact, tells me it was not a pack of wolves. <laughs> but then I think the last question, I think, why? Why would this white guy in Jersey in 1969 go out of his way when he was struggling to get his business afloat, why would he take so much time to help black families moving into his neighborhood? At a time of fears of white flight and real estate prices, why would he go to so much length when he was struggling in his business? And he tells me, Corey, I remember the moment I made the decision. And I go, the moment? He goes, yeah, I remember the exact moment. I go, okay, tell me the moment. He goes, well, 
I was sitting down in 1965, years before I was even born, watching TV. And some of you all remember, old enough to remember, we used to only have three channels back then. And at 11 o'clock, like, the news would go off. And then everything would just be done. I think it's why we had higher birth rates back then. Um, and, 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 and he says he's watching TV, sitting on his couch in Jersey. And, and he sees something that was rare that happened. Breaking news. You watch CNN now, it's breaking news every 10 seconds. Breaking news, Melania has a jacket. <laughs> but back then, this was rare. It broke away from the TV movie that he was watching. Now, I know the TV movie he was watching. I looked it up. It was called Judgment at Nuremberg. And so he's watching this very difficult movie. And then they break away to something tragic. They break away to a bridge in Alabama called the Edmund Pettus Bridge. I was just on that bridge two Sundays ago for this anniversary. And he says he's watching there as these marchers who started in Selma were trying to get to Montgomery. And at the beginning of their march, they get stopped on the Edmund Pettus Bridge by Alabama state troopers who would not let them pass. And, 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 and the marchers decided that they would kneel and pray and then turn around. And I know this because one of those marchers is now my colleague. He's always been my hero. His name is Congressman John Lewis. And he said that they were going to kneel and pray. You can definitely applaud John Lewis. Thank you. He, he said they were going to kneel and pray. But this guy is watching in Jersey that they don't get a chance to do that because the Alabama state troopers shoot gas at them, tear gas. And then they storm into those marchers and start viciously beating them with billy clubs. This guy is watching in horror. John Lewis said to me very humbly, he's this humble man, he goes, Corey, I shed a little bit of blood on that bridge that day. And I'm like, Congressman, no, your head was cracked open. You were knocked unconscious. You bled profusely. You had to be carried to safety. And so here is this guy on the couch in New Jersey watching this horror, and what does he do? Some of us see big problems in the world and we allow our inability to do everything to undermine our determination to do something. He can't afford a plane ticket to Alabama. He, realize, he can't close his business, he's struggling. But he does not sit there on that couch. He gets up and he thinks to himself, why don't I just do the best I can with what I have where I am? And he thinks to himself, maybe I can spare an hour of work of pro bono work on civil rights issues right here in New Jersey. He gets on a phone, calls around, and he finds this woman, young woman named Lee Porter. And she's, he says, do you need any legal help? He's like, she's like, hallelujah, thank you. I've been praying for some help. And, and, and they go to work, and he says, four years pass. He organizes other lawyers. He gets all these people involved. And then he says he gets this case file with two names on it. Carrie and Carolyn Booker with their two young children, a newborn baby and a two-year-old, my older brother. Think about this right now. A bunch of marchers on a bridge doing what? Standing up for us, not for black rights or white rights, standing up for American ideals on a bridge, and they failed that day. They were driven back, but just by standing up for what's right, just by standing up for patriotism. And what, dear God, is patriotism? It's love of country. And you cannot love your country unless you love your fellow country men and women. You don't always have to like folk or agree with folks, but love says, I see you, I know you, your destiny is interwoven with mine. We have one common destiny, and these people stood up in the name of love, and instantaneously, that energy left a thousand miles and changed the heart of one man on a couch in New Jersey, who then went on to change the destiny of a generation not yet born. I would not be running for President of the United States, I would not be a United States Senator if it wasn't for these powerful connections between Americans. Right now, we are in a crisis of faith in our country. Not in a religious sense, but people are losing their faith in us, in our ability to solve our own problems, in our ability to create a nation that works for everyone. Well, I reject that. I'm running for President because I believe in us. I believe our history speaks to the highest ideals of humanity. I believe that this country is called to be a light unto other nations. I believe we have tough problems, but they're not 
tougher than we are. And I believe if we in this election can make it about more than just beating one person and for one office, that we can make this election about not what we're against by, but what we're for. That if we as Democrats don't make this simply about beating Republicans, but the larger call to unite Americans. I believe that we can make this about us again and re-engaging, reactivating a calling for a more beloved community, then we will make our tomorrows better than our yesterdays. Then we will elevate this nation that we will, as a country, rise and rise again. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. So let's, let's jump in. First of all, I didn't even get your name. We worked together before. Yes, we did. Yes. Lori. Lori, I forgot, Lori. Lori has been incredible, especially for this guy that speaks really quickly. Would you give it up for Lori? She has been... And I want to teach everybody some sign language right now. Two things. One is this is thank you. Thank you, Lori. And then this is applause for Lori. <laughs> All right, thank you. I'm gonna go up here to, well, Sam is the man, I gotta ask him, because he's been giving me such great energy for my speech. <laughs> Sam, I love your shirt. It says, corporations are not people, no matter what Citizens United says. Sam, go ahead. Um, so Fox News is reporting that you have a, quote, radical vegan agenda. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that's true, that's why I'm here. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, for real, uh, a lot of us are really concerned about the things that the Trump administration has done uh, around animal rights, um, puppy mills, the uh, uh, rolling back of endangered species laws and regulations, um, the and the ag-gag rules that are uh, being really harmful to livestock all across the country. And I was wondering if you could speak to any of those issues. Thank you very much, Sam. So I don't care if you're a Republican or Democrat, if you're conservative, progressive, if you're a libertarian or yes, a vegetarian. Um, we have so much common ground in this country. And I have actually found Republicans to work with me on issues around animal uh, uh, cruelty. Because I, I know Americans. We, we don't want to see puppy mills. I know Americans, we don't want to see unnecessary chemical testing on animals when computer modeling could achieve the same thing. And so I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm a guy that loves animals. I, I can't tell you how much I love your two dogs today. <laughs> and so I, I stand up. I think you can tell a lot about a nation by the way they treat the most vulnerable. And I often talk about that in terms of prisons and jails and the addicted and the uh, folks struggling with mental illness. But you also can see what we allow happening to animals. And so I've been able to find a lot of common cause. And because of my work, uh, I've passed legislation that might surprise you. I passed a law, uh, part of a big chemical uh, reform bill. I made sure we got into that law, a ban on unnecessary chemical testing on animals, which saved a lot of suffering. I worked to end cockfighting as well in this country, and I will continue to stand up for that common ground of Americans who believe that we can still enjoy a steak dinner uh, without making, without being cruel, uh, unnecessarily cruel to animals. And it's just something I'm unapologetic about. I don't care what you put on your plate, eat what you want, we are a free country. Uh, um, but at the end of the day, let's do try to make sure that our, our every aspect of American life, uh, we should strive to have it affect, uh, to reflect the best of our values, okay? All right, I saw it over here. This, um, I'm gonna go with the woman on the right, just to show that I'm not just going to the left, I can go to the right as well. <laughs> Elizabeth, yes. Good morning. My name is Elizabeth Deutsch, and I was born in Patterson, New Jersey. Oh, uh, Jersey girl. Yes. In 1969. Oh my gosh, <laughs> my sister. <laughs> I think we're this is a big year. We're turning 30 this year if I do my math right. I, so. yes. I don't think I ever got over, the, over 22, so <laughs> I don't know how you age. Um, I'm also a nurse for 22 years. Um, and uh, in the State of the Union, uh, Donald Trump said, we can end the epidemic by 2030. Well, I work for Housing Works. And love Housing Works. Love Housing love Works. Housing works. Um, we believe that we can end the epidemic by 2025. And every expert agrees with us. Um, in New York City, we're on track to end the epidemic of HIV and AIDS. Sorry, for everyone else who doesn't know about Housing Works, um, we are working to end the epidemic of HIV and AIDS. In New York City, we're on track to do it by 2020. So uh, by the next election, we are hoping to have that epidemic ended. So 2030 is definitely doable, but 2025 
is actually attainable to end an epidemic that has wiped out an entire generation of people the same way the opioid crisis is wiping out generations now. Um, and so what I want to know is, will you commit to ending the epidemic by 2025? Will you put the money into housing and medication and PEP and PrEP and all of the things that go into solving a true healthcare crisis? Um, and something that, that none of us thought in the beginning of this epidemic was achievable. And now we see through the advancement of science, yes. like actual real science, yes. that we can change and save people's lives. So Elizabeth, um, right now is one out of 100 senators. Um, it's one thing to make that commitment, but should I be your president, elected in 2020, sworn in in January of 2021, that gives me my first term to run at that problem and goal, and I, I promise you, I will give all my heart and soul to doing things uh, to end the epidemic. Now let me be clear, this is not something I just started at. I've spent more years as a mayor than I did as a United States Senator. And as a mayor, this was a priority for me. We built the first new construction housing for people with HIV and AIDS, I'm sorry. No, I can definitely speak up. <laughs> when I was a mayor, we, we focused on this issue because I said, this is my community. We're going to do more for people with HIV and AIDS. And housing is such an important issue. And we built the first new HIV and AIDS housing with a little help from, from philanthropy from a guy named Bon Jovi. You can always go to a Jersey guy to help out. Um, but this is something I believed in all my life, that, that, that ending the AIDS crisis is not a matter of can we, it's a matter of do we have the collective will. If I am President of the United States, I will manifest that will from day one and not just work on it on an issue for the United States. I believe we have a role with PEPFAR and a lot of other programs out there to help to end the global epidemic of AIDS and we can do that. And then the last thing I want to say on this, because she's mentioning something we used to be. I, I, I want to get back to my grandparents' generation when we led the planet Earth on things that mattered. We had the best infrastructure on the planet Earth. We've trashed it and have turning over to our children trillions of dollars of infrastructure deficit because we're not investing in us anymore. We had the best education system, ranked number one on the planet Earth. We have disinvested in public education, disinvested in early childhood education, while our, uh, disinvested in higher education. Pell Grants needs to cover 80% of the cost of college. We need to go back to saying we will lead on education. The number three area I want to say where we used to lead is on R&D. Research. We were the number one research intensive economy on the planet. That means the percentage of your money you're investing in research to percentage of your GDP. We are not even, we're barely hanging on to being in the number 10 position right now. And what does that mean? Well, when we led on research, we led on jobs and industry and curing diseases. Everybody who has a smartphone right now, that was our common investments, the satellite navigation, the battery life. If we, if I become President of the United States, we are going to lead on research and development. Why? Because when my father has dementia, and that alone, if we don't do more research in Alzheimer's, things like that are going to bankrupt our country if we don't start finding ways to lead. And so this is really important to me. We had a president that got elected saying, winning, winning, winning. Well, he's not backing up his statements. It's one thing to stand before the American public and talk about HIV and AIDS. But then when your budget that you just submitted cuts funding to those programs, then that's what you call a hypocrite. And we're going to make sure that we have integrity again in the White House, that when you say something, your budget will reflect that. That's my plan for rural Americans. And number one is we are going to have, if I'm president of the United States, a massive rural infrastructure plan. As I've traveled from rural Iowa to rural New Hampshire, I'm stunned from the water quality issues to no access to broadband. We need to have a rural investment to make sure that the infrastructure is there so people can build communities. Number two is we need to have investment in rural areas. I've already passed probably the biggest rural investment bill there is called Opportunity Zones where every single uh, um, governor, and they've already done it here in New Hampshire as well, can designate 20% of their lowest income places. As we look across the map in America, some of them are urban places like Camden, New Jersey, but many of them are rural areas. I've met with Heflin, Alabama leaders who are telling me already our legislation, which gives incredible tax incentives to people to invest, is going to create hundreds of jobs in their community. Community. And that's one thing we have to get investment back, and I'll double down on doing those things. Number three, rural education is critical. And right now, a lot of kids don't have great educational pathways. If you have a rural school, for example, you are really struggling. 
because the, the federal government, for example, does not fulfill its share of special needs funding. So if you have a few special needs kids, beautiful children, that by law you have to provide full funding for, often those schools now have real challenges. If, the, if we as a federal government just funded special needs education fully at the 40% level we're supposed to, and that would be money for rural education, which is really important. Rural teachers, we, we have a situation where a lot of teachers can't afford even to go to rural communities. The salaries are too low and they're carrying too much debt. I'm going to have the most ambitious program, not only for forgiving the debt of teachers, but also giving them the kind of tax benefit. It's obnoxiously offensive to me that teachers have a tax treatment that is worse in ter than, than Wall Street stockbrokers. And we need to correct that balance. So I am very focused on rural America. And a lot of it's because of the, of, of the question that Kate asked. We need to be a party that has a rural agenda. And the last thing I'm gonna say, to the, Sam, to your question, we are killing American farmers right now. We're ending the independent family farm as we know it in America because we're allowing unchecked corporate consolidation to drive our farmers out of business. That tomato or broccoli you buy at the co-op here, it is the, the consumer, the share of that consumer dollar for farmers is down about 50%. And so I was with my favorite farmer in the Senate, a guy named Tester. Uh, um, he and I represent the largest girth in all of the Senate. We're very large people. And, and he and I were just talking. He's a farmer himself. We've got to stop what's happening in ag and start having agricultural policies that support the independent family farmer and fix a broken food system that's really suffering because of all this corporate consolidation in the ag. All right, I'm going to go. There was, I'm going to go here, and then I'm going to go to the gentleman back there, OK? Yep, yes, you. But we're going to go here first. Your daughter was born, in your, was born with light upon her. <laughs> anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm a, uh, an educational researcher, and I, did, I was doing research on underserved communities across America. I've been in many, many states. And the Newark schools, it was, I, I had my, being a New Yorker, my image of Newark was a little, and, and I went into the Newark schools. They were the best schools that I, that were in the study. So I just wanted to say that. Thank you very much. I will not uh, object to that statement okay. at all. And um, and I'm devastated about Betsy DeVos and everything that she's doing. Um, so I'm not going to ask you an educational question because I know where I know I trust you. But um, to follow up on the question from the young woman who asked about your uh, supporting the Democratic nominee, should you become the nominee? How will you deal with Donald Trump as an as a as an opponent because of the way he fights and the way he and the and just the tactics that he used? How how will you be the candidate to beat Donald Trump? Right. So remember, the opposite of justice is often not injustice; it's apathy, inaction, and indifference. We as Democrats have all the votes we need to win just about every office, but too often we're not engaging people to get into the process. I know Pennsylvania, I was just in Philly a few days ago, and they were talking, if, if Philadelphia alone got 7,000 more votes more, and there was a lot of people, tens of thousands that didn't vote in Philadelphia alone, if they had 7,000 more votes, she would have won that state. The same thing with Wayne County, where Detroit is, if they had just got activated their base. So the first part is getting our own base excited and energized to get out and fight. And I believe that if we do that, number one, and get, get our base of voters, we're going to win. But that's not enough for me. Because I really do we have, believe we have a message for the rest of America. I was with some union heads the other day who told me 50% of union members in some of their unions were voting for Donald Trump, which is unbelievable. Here's a party that is attacking unions like never before, attacking Davis-Bacon, forcing states uh, uh, to, to right to work, become right to work states. Union America is on its knees because of Republican policies. And I want to make sure that we're reaching out to rural communities, to our union brothers and sisters, and let them know that we are the party for them and we have an agenda for them in their lives. And then the final thing I will say, because people ask me this all the time. I got asked by this by some uh, a snarky uh, a reporter one time. Corey, you talk about loving people all the time. Um, uh, um, or do you love Donald Trump? And I, and I just basically said, look, I, I'm my mom taught Sunday school, okay? And, and, and she taught me to love my enemies. And I'm not gonna let anybody drag me so low as to contort my soul and make me hate them. But I'm also a former football player for Stanford University. You put me on the field, 
and you will have no stronger and harder fighter than I am. And I'm going to prove that in this state by going all over, working from early in the morning to late at night. I will fight for us. I will fight for kids in struggling public schools. I'll fight for people with inadequate health care. It's what I've done all my life. It's why I live in a tough inner city, because I'm going to stand with you and fight for you. And if I'm your nominee, I'm going to fight, and we are going to win. All right? The gentleman, yes, sir. Hi, my name is Will Tansky. I'm from Grantham. And an issue that's really important to me is gay rights. But um, we're, we live in like a pretty mixed area, so there are some of the kindest people you've ever, you've ever met that are like really staunchly conservative. So I'm just wondering what your opinions are on balancing religious freedom with gay rights and that agenda. I, I don't see how the two are in any way opposed to each other. You know, as an African American, and my parents and grandparents told me stories. That people used to use religion as an excuse to discriminate against a second class citizenship for African Americans. And people stood up and just said, wait a minute, that, that should not be. We should have laws to protect against discrimination. The freedom of religion, believe what you want, but we should not have a country that allows any minority to be discriminated against. And so I believe fully in religious freedom. I was in South Carolina meeting with a whole bunch of black pastors. I grew up in a black church, and they asked me the similar question. And I said, look, I belong to Metropolitan Baptist Church in Newark, New Jersey, and my pastor is not going to do any gay marriages in his church. And the government shouldn't ever force him to. It's his church. And, and I might be one of those parishioners that wants to talk to him every once in a while about these issues. But this is where we are in America right now. 30% of gay and lesbian youth report not going to school because of fear. And we have Betsy DeVos in the Education Department rolling back protections for LGBTQ kids, kids. If you look at homeless youth, overwhelmingly the significant part of them are gay and lesbian youth. We now have violence against gay and lesbians in this country that just as we see an increase in homophobia, uh, excuse me, an increase in Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, we're also seeing an increase in attacks. And tr the trans community, my brother's child is transgender. The, the kind of discrimination that they're enduring and violence and murder of trans Americans is unacceptable to me. And so I believe in equal rights. That's why yesterday, a bill that I originally cold sponsored, we had, day before yesterday, excuse me, we had a big, a big, big uh, a press conference pushing again something called the Equality Act. Now what's the Equality Act? Most Americans don't know that in the majority of states in our nation, you now can get married to anybody you want, but if you post your pictures of your gay marriage in most states in America, you can lose your job and have no legal recourse just because you're gay. You can be fired because you're gay. You can be denied service in a restaurant, just like my grandparents and parents were, just because of who you are. You could, you could actually not be able to stay at a hotel just because you're gay. That was wrong for black Americans, it's wrong for gay Americans, it's wrong for any Americans, and if I am President of the United States, I will fight to end this kind of discrimination. All right? Aaron, step forward. Aaron is yelling at me from the sidelines. Last question. Aaron is my leader here in the state. Some, you got some fans back here. Aaron, I'm running for president, you're not. <laughs> All right. But Aaron just said, last question, I, I try to sometimes tell people I'm, I'm the boss of me, so I'm going to take two more questions <laughs> just to prove my independence, but then I'm actually going to stay put. I'm not leaving. I'm going to answer any of the questions you come up to me. I will take selfies. I have a master's degree in selfie taking. Um, so please understand, if you don't get your question answered, please come up to me. And so we're going to go to this gentleman here in, in the glasses, and then we're going to go to the, the dead cent center to you. Yes. Yes, sir. So, I'm a Jewish American, and I'm a huge supporter of Israel, but some of the comments that have been made recently by freshman members of Congress, and the way that a lot of uh, members of the Democratic Party have jumped to support these comments, even after comments about things like dual loyalty, which is a completely fake idea and a very anti-Semitic idea. So, I'm wondering how you, well, I'm, I'm sure you're supportive of the rights of Palestinians, as they are, of course, uh, human. Hold the mic closer because I really want the people to hear this question. Uh, as they are humans and people, but I want to make sure and I want to know how you're going to make sure that the United States relationship with Israel and the United States support of Israel stays strong. Thank, thank you. What's your name again? Uh, Alex. Alex. Alex, can you come up here for a second because I just want people to see your shirt. It's just such a great shirt. 
<laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Thank you very much. Um, so, th th <laughs> all right, stay put. This is a good picture. You were page last last Congress. No, yes, yesterday. Oh, oh, you, you, oh, he's a page here. Yeah, yesterday. That was a long day. Awesome. All right. And okay, so his question was about the state of Israel, and I want to be very clear: Israel is an essential ally of the United States of America. They're a democracy in a sea of challenges. Um, we have, from the very founding of the state of Israel, been their uh, incredible partner. Uh, I have voted to support, in a bipartisan fashion, the defense of the state of Israel, the security. Part. I've gone over probably more times to Israel since I've been a senator than any other country to look at the tunneling operation that was being done uh, on their western side, where people are using tunnels to try to kidnap uh, Israelis and the like. So please, um, uh, you've got to understand that this, to me, is a issue that was important to me before I was a United States Senator, it was important to me as a President. Israel has a right to exist and a right to defend itself. I love what you said though about Palestinian people, that they deserve to have human rights and human dignity. And this administration that's pulling funding away from nonprofits that are helping with things like clean water, access to hospitals, is unacceptable to me. We can be a country that stands firm with the defense of Israel and affirm the human rights and work hard to find a two-state solution uh, so that we have uh, people with the right to self-determination. I want to um, finish by saying this. The guy that took a punch for my family was named Marty Friedman. Jewish Americans were leaders in the civil rights movement. My parents told me very emotional stories about Americans who happened to also be Jewish and the extent that they went to so that I could stand right here, right now. There were three people named Goodman, Cheney, and Schwarner. Black guy, two white guys, a Christian guy, and two Jewish guys that died in Mississippi for voting rights. And there is this ideal that I believe in Judaism uses the word tzedakah. It's actually a word that is similar to the Muslim word, the, the Arabic word. And, and the word tzedakah, many people who are Jewish think it means charity, but it actually doesn't. It means justice. And this call that, that, that the Torah talks about to, to do justice, or what, O oh Lord, do you want from your people of Israel is to do justice. What I love about so many of the Jewish Americans that I know I have this saying about religion. Before you tell me about your religion, first show it to me and how you treat other people. And Jewish Americans in this country have been standing up for the freedom and rights, not just of African Americans, but for this nation. And if you come against Jewish Americans with anti-Semitism, we all have a moral obligation, whether it's anti-Semitism, whether it's uh, uh, homophobia, to stand against injustice and create sadaqa and do what the Torah calls to kun olam, to heal this world. So thank you. All right, thank you. All right. Last. And your shirt's nice too. It, I don't like it quite as much. Oh, I, oh, I like the pin. I got another one. It's on my coat. Okay. Um, my name's Lindsay Dearborn. I live here in Lebanon. And you've talked about where our country has shown leadership in the past. Um, and we're not alone. We're in a world. Yes. And I'm concerned about how our standing and what we do, how we operate in the world has taken a nosedive. What will you do to bring it back up? So we've taken a nosedive for, not, uh, for a number of reasons, I think, but really it's been this presidency and what they do in attacking our allies? How can we have someone who's closer to Putin than they are to Merkel or to May? We've seen a president who has uh, bullied world leaders just here to the north and Canadian. We are using a national security waiver to put tariffs on our best ally on the planet Earth, the Canadians, as if they were a national security threat. I mean, I, I see Trudeau and sometimes I feel a little, you know, like, come on, man, too much hair. But he's not really a threat. We need to make sure as a country that we are standing with our allies because this country, this world is becoming a more dangerous place. It's becoming more dangerous because of Russian aggression in places like the Ukraine, even Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, their aggression, we need to stand with our NATO allies. 
We need to stand with our other nation, our other allies, because our planet is in peril with climate change. And at a time when America should be leading the planet Earth to solve this problem, we are retreating from global climate treaties, uh, global climate agreements, uh, and putting our head in the sand and even denying that climate change exists. If I am President of the United States, I'm going to reach out to our allies to make sure we are strong and united for justice, whether it's responding to, to human rights violations, whether it's responding to Russian aggression, whether it's responding uh, uh, to climate change. It is about standing up and being strong, as I've mentioned this whole talk of mine. Being strong also means reaching out and creating strength through unity. And, and I want to end with that, uh, if I can take that uh, as a moment. I, I think I, I've heard, every, everywhere I've gone in this incredible state, I, I feel what I feel, which is a little bit of just worry and anxiety about the crossroads before us. It is an existential threat, I think, that if we as a nation continue in the way that we are, I, I worry when I go to areas and, and, and see how America's pulling back funding to deal with people in crisis, with refugees. I talked about Trudeau before. I mean, heck, when they are taking more refugees than we are as a country, I worry about what our values, what we say. When we, when we tear apart families at the border and have immigration laws that are making us less safe because they're attacking the fundamental values that we built a great nation on, that worries me. And so to the folks here in this room that are worried right now, I share your worry because we are in a dark place on a lot of issues. And if I could end with something that a young man reminded me of, and, and the woman who asked me this question about hope. You know, I have a favorite place that sounds a little strange because it's where an American tragedy happened. And I, and I love going there. My brother used to live in Memphis, so I would love going there and standing at the Lorraine Motel where, where Martin Luther King was assassinated, murdered. And, and I, the reason why I like to stand there is because of something that's written at that very site, which I think speaks to the, the moment, moral moment we are in history right now. It comes from a passage in, in, in the Bible, in the Torah, and the Quran, which many of you know, whether you're religious or not, you know the story. It's from the story of Joseph, who had this coat of many, many colors and was a guy that interpreted dreams. And it was said right before Joseph was grabbed by his brothers and thrown to, to die in a well. Now there's a saying from Judaism that says, sometimes you gotta go to the pit before you go to the palace. Now Joseph went on to become a leader in Egypt and, 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 and have a very different life. But sometimes, we all know this from our own stories, you go to very dark places that are the precursor to a major breakthroughs of light. I believe we in a nation, we are in a pit right now. If you travel this country, forget politics for a second, but you see the things that I've seen of Americans struggling, feeling alone with things, as I said, opioid addiction, suicide, lack of adequate health care, teachers who reach into their own pocket despite having thousands and thousands of dollars of debt to try to make some, give them something to their kids, whether it's buying school supplies. I sat with a principal last night who told me about going to Staples to buy school supplies for his school and ran into a teacher who was doing the same thing. We are in a pit right now that God, if my grandparents were still alive, would, would say, what's happened to the country we gave you? That just overcame Jim Crow, that just built the greatest infrastructure, that was leading in science and research, that made a commitment to public education. What happened? When we built Europe back through the Marshall Plan and showed our allies, not with our words, but that we got your back, we'll be there. Stand with us against communism and totalitarianism. We are in the pit right now. And so when Joseph's brothers grabbed him and threw him into that pit, they uttered something really powerful that the people who were forming a museum in Memphis, Tennessee, thought those words were so powerful, such a call to future generations, that they would write those words from the Torah and the Bible right there at the site of one of America's greatest tragedy, when one of our heroes was slain. And what does it say in those words? What were the words of Joseph's brothers? What's the calling to this moral moment right now? 
The words say simply this. Behold, here cometh the dreamer. Let us slay him and see what becomes of his dream. The dream of America is in the balance right now. What will we choose? Hate or love? What will we choose? Community or disunity? What will we choose? To stand together or fall apart? There is a dream in this land, as Langston Hughes said, with its back against the wall. To save the dream for one, we must save the dream for all. This is not just about an election for an office. This is about a larger campaign for our country, a campaign that started on Bunker Hill. It started in, in barns where people met in secret to plot the formation of an underground railroad because we are one nation with one road and one destiny. This is a dream that has been fought for and died for by blacks and whites, Christians and Jews. Goodman Cheney Schwarner, behold, here cometh the dreamer. He has been slain, but what will this generation do about the dream? Will I dream of an America again? This generation, we must dream again of America. Of an America where every child doesn't just have a school but a cathedral of learning. Dream of an America where nobody puts aside life for saving drugs because they can't afford it. Dream of an America where veterans come home to not just celebrations and parades, but to health care and economic opportunity. Dream of an America again where every one of our brothers and sisters has a job with dignity and can retire with security. And if we're bold enough to dream like that together and not see each other as enemies or adversaries, but create more unity in this community, put more indivisible back in this one nation under God, then we as a nation will rise. Thank you.